Welcome to God's Truth. I'm your instructor, Dr. D. Todd Harrison, as we continue to flood the world with God's truth. This year we've been looking at the New Testament of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today we'll be looking at first and second Peter, that great apostle Peter. Uh, he's been off in Babylon and uh, what appears to be church in activity for 14 years. Now he writes this epistle uh, from Babylon as he starts to, at the end of his life, become what Jesus had hoped he would become, Peter the Rock. And uh, that's what it, the Jesus needed him to be. He stands up, he goes forward, preaches the gospel. He starts to re-fortalize um, re and, um, and, and fortify all the places and the towns and the cities that Paul had gone through for many years to uh, re-solidify the gospel among them on his way to being crucified as his Lord and Savior prophesied that he would one day be crucified. Okay, so let's look at Peter, uh, chapter 1, and uh, uh, First Peter. And we'll look at verses 1 through 6. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So now we know that compared to Paul, uh, you know, Peter's the actual administrative apostle, member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, remember, uh, Paul had admitted he did not hold any kind of uh, position at all within the church, but he called himself an apostle as one having been sent forward uh, by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the aliens, the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. So you become the elect of God, having received the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, starts to sanctify and purify your soul, purge you against sin, purge out of your desires to sin, all the flesh, all the lusts of the flesh, as you become a sanctified, glorious being. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So begotten us again, right? We were sent to the earth. We had lived with God before as spiritual children of God. He sent us to earth. And now through the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the atonement of Jesus Christ, we become again the children of God. To inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, the fate is not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold. See, if you, if you try it, it's more than purifying gold in the fire. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So you withstand the temptations of life. You become purified as the heavenly gold, as the children of God. You will be in glory when Jesus comes back for a second coming. Verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love, right? Most of you will not see Jesus Christ in this life, right? But you have faith and you receive the witness of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ lives, that he rose from the dead, that he sits as a glorified being in heaven. And as a result of all that, you love him. Though now you see him not yet believing, you, you believe, yet rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So. Uh, you will receive uh, salvation to your souls if you love Jesus Christ, whom you have not seen. If you continue to keep his commandments, you will receive salvation and be glorified. In verse uh, 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ 
and the glory that should follow. So we're going to learn about this next year in the Book of Mormon. The Old Testament prophets foresaw the days of Jesus Christ. They received visions and revelations concerning Jesus Christ and his death and atonement for the sins of mankind. doesn't matter that it doesn't teach that in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets foresaw the days of Jesus Christ. They received visions and revelations of Jesus Christ, even if they're not currently found. In the Old Testament, having been cut out by the great and abominable church as they tried to defy, to fight against the Lamb of God. Okay. 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost set down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. 14 through 25. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So idea is we want to become like God and do our best to live like him. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, so you are not you are now redeemed with, you know, the, your soul was not purchased with silver and gold. It was purchased at 19 with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot, Meaning, just like the lambs that they were sacrificing had to be physically perfect without blemish, Jesus Christ had to be perfectly, physically perfect without blemish. Now, a lot of times people take that to mean other things than just that, physically perfect. Not necessarily ethically perfect or any of these things. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we point out all the time, have no problem. Uh, you know, talking about the life of Jesus Christ and his character and the things that he did and, the th you know, and so forth. So, uh, uh, you know, we're careful how we approach that. We don't want to go around bash down Jesus, right? But, uh, you know, he, he did some things in there that, you know, it would shock people if they actually read the New Testament. So, obviously, when they talk about Jesus was perfect, we're talking again just like the lambs. He was perfect. In his DNA, he was perfect as a physical being. Uh, remember that the uh, that the Y chromosome is passed down father to son, father to son. While the Y chromosome in Adam, when he fell, was corrupted. So he passed down, Adam, from father to son, father to son, this corrupted Y chromosome. Jesus, father, was God. He received a perfect Y chromosome, okay? So therefore, he was perfect without blemish, just like these lambs had to be to be sacrificed for the sins of ancient Israel. Okay. Who verily was foreordained. Jesus Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world but that he would come forward in this time that he did to die for the sins of the world. Who by him do believe, in verse 21, in God that raised them up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing that you have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the spirit and unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of men is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the Lord, word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So great chapter 1 for St. Peter. Chapter 2, let's look at 1 through 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. It would so be of tasted that the Lord is gracious. So first thing we do when we 
teach someone the gospel, we teach them the milk of the gospel. We teach them the basic principles. Not so we can end it at that in the rest of their life to just be taught the basic principles of the gospel so that later on when every wind of false doctrine is tossed their way, then they get tossed aside, right? But that's the starting point. As he says here, that they may grow thereby. Lay that solid foundation of the basic principles. Then you expect them to gain greater knowledge and greater theological insight. As Paul said, when I was a, uh, you know, when I was an adult, I put away childish things, right? To, you grow into the mysteries of, of God so that then you have this solid foundation with great theological insight. Now the devil tosses false doctrine in your face. You don't fall for it. You don't go off and worship false creeds of false uh, Christianity and, and other the, such false uh, uh, heretical uh, notions. Okay. 7 through 12. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. Jesus Christ is precious. But to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. And it be, Jesus beca becomes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye, the members of the church, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that it should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we'll look at uh, 23 through 25. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. When they beat him up at the trial and spit in his face and punched him, he did not uh, turn back and, and, you know, take those guys out, right? He, at one point, threatened, I could call down 10 legions of angels right now, right? When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself in vain that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now ye return unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The true bishop is Jesus Christ, as people serve in the capacity and in the ministry calling as being a bishop, you are to serve as Jesus Christ did, right? You are representing Jesus Christ, the great bishop and shepherd of your souls. Chapter 3, we'll look at 8 through 12. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil, for evil, a railing for railing, right? The Old Testament law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, if somebody hits you, you hit them back, right? But he's saying, you know, let's learn not to do that. Let's learn to be more forgiving of others. Let's learn to be like Jesus and just, you know, suffer it and, and not render back to them, right? Because why? In the end of verse 9, that ye should inherit a blessing. Jesus Christ knows what you're suffering for his name. And blessed are those who suffer in his name. They will receive a great blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So if you want to love your life and be happy in your life, and you want to you know, have a good life, you need to learn to do that. Refrain your tongue from evil. Don't say bad words. Don't say, don't spread gossip about other people. That's a great promise, right? If you'll do those things. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. You want the Lord to be against you? Go out and do evil. You may think you're getting away with it on a short time. In the short term, the day will come when you'll stand before a holy and just God and suffer the just merits of, 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 for what you've done. Chapter 4, 
Uh, we'll look now at um, 15 through 22. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's why we need to study the gospel and read the scriptures every day so we're prepared. If someone asks you a question about the gospel, you should be able to answer it. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. Isn't it better to suffer, you know, because you were living a righteous life than to suffer for doing bad things? For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Here we go, guys. Again, we ask the question: which church is the only church? In all the world, who actually believes in the Bible? Again, the answer is very clear. It comes through hundreds and hundreds of times in the Old and New Testament. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only one who actually actively teaches that when Jesus Christ died, he went and set up missionary work and preached to the spirits in prison. We're the only ones. It's right here in the Bible, but they all just overlook it and don't read it because, you know, how do you form a false church? Well, you have to uh, not read the Bible, right? So as long as you keep your uh, your congregation from reading the Bible, you can teach them whatever false doctrine you want. Well, when they start reading the Bible, they see that your false doctrines are totally corrupt and uh, and you know, your church has no, uh, no claim at all to divine authority, no divine direction, you even out there trying to say there is no more revelation. So... In other words, you're admitting that you don't receive direction from Jesus Christ to lead your church. He's, you're declaring he has nothing to do with your church when you make those kinds of comments. Okay, so Jesus Christ, when he died during those three days, went and preached to the spirits in prison. And uh, he set up missionary work and sent forth elders and, and the sisters to go out there and teach uh, the gospel to those who had not had the opportunity to receive the gospel while they lived on the earth. Okay, and then in 22, after those, after the third day, uh, in 22, he, Jesus Christ went into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being sub, made subject unto him. Chapter 4, let's look at uh, 1 through 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So even if they kill you, hey, be, be happy. You, you've ceased from sin, right? You can't sin. Now. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. Verse 6. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Ah, interesting. Peter's now mentioned it a second time that the gospel is being preached, to, uh, being preached to those who are dead. Again, we ask, who's the only church in all the world who teaches the Bible? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And here it is. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, that's an important part of this whole um, preaching to the, the, to the the to those who are dead and performing baptism by proxy on their behalf, that they're still being judged according to men in the flesh, right? So all mankind are born with a with the with a conscience. We know that to be the light of Christ, which tell, informs every person what is good and what is evil. So God's still going to judge you whether you listen to that light, whether you listen to the light of Christ, and whether you had a good life or not. He's still going to judge you by that. But by performing the baptism by proxy, you're able to receive that baptism and receive all the greatest blessings that God has prepared for the members of his church and kingdom. Verse 7, But the end of all things is a hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. If you learn to love one another and 
have love that will cover a lot of, he'll forgive you of a lot of your sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, right? When you preach the gospel or pretend to preach the gospel, you don't just say what you, what's on your mind, what you would like to say about it, to, you know, to the topics that you want to teach. No, you teach what God wants you to, to say. You talk like he says here. As the oracles of God, you speak. When you talk about the gospel, you should be preaching according to the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of revelation, allowing God to speak through you to the people that you're addressing so that they know they have heard the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. So that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange happened to you. Don't think it's strange if, some, if you say, go through some terrible trial. Jesus Christ said you will have trials in this life, but you shall have peace through him. Beloved, um, 13, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory should be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on his behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of be of them that don't even obey the gospel of God? So it's for telling a day in which there will be judgments poured out upon the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His church, his church, he will begin there, prior to the second coming, he will pour out his judgments upon the wicked members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today, we continue to see more and more members of his church depart from his ways and live a wicked life. Those will be judged first. Those will receive the just desert of their misconduct. Then after that, he begins to clean and destroy and passes judgments upon those who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay, and he says here, uh, and then in 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Okay, so now we next go to chapter 5, and he says here, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So many preachers in this world Want to be a preacher for the money. That is not according to God's will. That is not according to God's wishes. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being the samples to the flock. Some, some want to just have the power. And they think that being a bishop is a good thing, that it somehow gives them some power over a few hundred people. That's not God's way. You will be judged for your wickedness. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Those who are, do it, who serve in the, in, in the church to by being an example. They want to be an example to the flock. They are the ones who shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace. To humble. You want grace? You need to be humble. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast in all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are on the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Peter, coming out of Babylon, here he says here in the, uh, 13, by the church that is at Babylon. So towards the end of his 14 years there in Babylon, he starts to build up a church there in Babylon as well. And they send their greetings here in his letter. Okay, moving now to Second Peter. Second Peter, verse one, uh, chapter one. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. So you can receive and build and, and build up your faith until you shall have the faith of a Simon Peter. You can have the same testimony as an apostle of Jesus Christ, if you will continue to work for it. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Apostates, evangelicals, Protestants, again, <laughs> another verse for you, G. Boy, how the Bible just continues to let you down, doesn't it? it continues to destroy your false doctrine, your false her heresies that you preach from the pulpit, doesn't it? Once again, supporting who? The only church who believes once again in the Bible, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Verse 3, according to his divine power, has given us all things. Who's the only ones that believe that you can become a God and receive all things just as the Bible promises? Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, other you false apostates go out, try to attack the church, try to say bad things about the church. You get mad because they teach and believe in the Bible. Isn't it interesting? So, once again, Peter, Paul had said it multiple times. Peter's now saying it. You get all things that pertain unto life and godliness, godliness. All things that a God possesses will be yours if you're faithful to him as a member of his church and kingdom. Right here is what the Bible said. The church didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. Read, watch our lessons on Peter. It's over and over again. The Bible continues to teach that doctrine. Read it. It often helps you to go before you go around saying the Bible says this or the you know, the Bible says that to actually read what the Bible says, you know, before you open your mouth like that, make a fool out of yourselves. Okay, he says here in verse 4, whereby given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. Yeah, exceedingly great and precious promises. All things of a God, all things of godliness right here. That you might, that these, you might be partakers of what? The divine nature. Isn't that interesting? You will become God. You become a part of the divine nature. You receive a body that's divine. That's divine nature. That's made like God. That's like God-like. Just like, well, guess who said it? Your, your apostle Paul, didn't he? Said it multiple times. Watch our lessons on Paul. Said it multiple times. The same thing being taught again by the Bible. The only church in all the world who believes in the Bible all the way from Genesis 1-1 through Revelation, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. No other church even comes close to believing the same amount of the Bible that the Church of Jesus Christ does. Okay, so we become the partakers of the divine nature and therefore escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So now how do you become a, the part of the divine nature? Here you go. You ask God to help you to do the following. Give all diligence to keep in his commandments, not the law of Moses, not the works. Works of law always refers to the law of Moses, the 613 commandments, the 300 plus that you need to be doing on a daily basis and the 300 
prohibitions of the law. When you talk about works, works means law of Moses in every single case here in the New Testament. Works has nothing to do with keeping the Ten Commandments or with following the ethical teachings of Jesus Christ. Diligence give to, um, then add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge of the gospel, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they may make you that you shall never neither be bare nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. They don't even have the spirit, they don't even have the spirit to even perceive spiritual things. And have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if these if you do these things, you shall never fall. So you receive your call and election made sure, meaning you can know through divine revelation to you that you are sealed up into eternal life before you die, um, you know, from mortality. Before you die, you can know through revelation that you're sealed up into eternal life. That is called a calling and election made sure. Separately, but yet in some uh, sort of fashion with this, there may be some other Temple ordinances involved here. So, uh, but that is not necessary to know through divine revelation that you are sealed up unto eternal life. Once you're sealed up to eternal life, you can receive Jesus Christ Himself to be your comforter. No longer is it necessary to have the Holy Ghost as your comforter. You can have Jesus appear to you from time to time to be your comforter. That's why He says here. That if these things will be in you, they shall make that you shall neither be bare nor fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be proving your knowledge of Jesus Christ, for you will have, for you will, if you have the faith, after receiving a call, I should make sure, if you have the faith, you can receive the second comforter to have Jesus appear to you from time to time. Therefore, that's what he's talking about here in verse 8. You should not be bare nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the sad things is those who have received their call election made sure, but don't have the faith to take it a step further and receive the second comforter. That's sad in those cases. Can you see Jesus Christ? Also, another question often arises, can you see Jesus Christ without receiving, without receiving a second comforter? The answer is absolutely yes. You can see Jesus Christ without receiving a second comforter. The second comforter simply means that then Jesus will appear to you from time to time, multiple appearances um, after that stage. Okay. All right, let's continue on here then. And 12 through 14. 12 through 14. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it means as long as I am in the tabernacle to steer you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing that surely I, may put, I must put off this ta- my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has, has showed me, I will be crucified as Jesus prophesied of me. Moreover, I endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Okay, then 20 through, let's see. Uh, 16, here we go. Here's his testimony. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables where when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. These stories you saints are hearing about Jesus Christ are not just stories and fables like you hear about Hercules and, you know, and the Olympus and, you know, and Zeus and, uh, you know, all these Greek uh, gods and so forth. They're not just fables. We are eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Ha ha. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we're not just following fables here about the life of Jesus. We were eyewitness of it. And in fact, look what he did here, right? Earlier in 
in Matthew and so forth, we get the cloud again, right? We get the flying cloud that flies around with God speaking out of it. Some cloud, right? Now, we've looked at many times what that is exactly and, and so forth. You know, obviously, it's a physical object that's flying around the heavens. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of these examples all the way for the last two years going through the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? So look what he calls it here. He doesn't use the word cloud here, does he? He's calling it the excellent glory, right? They're used to seeing horses and chariots. He saw this magnificent, the glory of God with the, you know, with full with the glory of God. It would have been a wonderful thing to a witness there. Out of the glory, what he's calling the excellent glory, he heard the voice, this is my beloved son and whom I am will please. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, weren't you? You do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Therefore, you cannot just sit down and interpret uh, what the scriptures mean unless you have the same spirit of prophecy and are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. If you're moved upon by the Holy Ghost, now the prophecy of scriptures unveils itself, and now you understand the scriptures. Chapter 2, 1 through 9. And here we go again, the witness of the apostasy of the first century uh, Christian church, that it did come into apostasy as the prophets had testified would have it. Chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. So here you have Peter, the eyewitness, testify that there were false prophets among the church teaching false things. That's the beginning of the apostasy. The church goes into apostasy for nearly 2,000 years until God has to once again restore the truth, the truth of his church when he does it in 1830s with the prophet Joseph Smith. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Not only were there false prophets, you should also have false teachers among you. Once they start saying, once you're a false religious leader, start telling you there are no more prophets in, in these days. Now they become false teachers, right? They call themselves teachers now. So now they're false teachers. Exactly what, what we what Peter just prophesied, we've seen in the history of Christianity. They shall bravely bring in damnable heresies. Damnable heresies. They're going to start teaching that Jesus has no body, no parts, no passions. But we were the eyewitnesses of his glory. We are the witnesses. We felt a marsh in his hands and in his feet. We saw him say to us, handle me and see for a spirit does not have a body of flesh and bones as you see that I have. So Peter here prophesied of the damnable heresies of the Trinitarian creeds of false Christianity beginning with the Nicene Creed in, the, in 325 and going thereafter multiple uh, creeds coming out of that out of these damnable heresies is what Peter calls them. Even denying the Lord that bought them. Yeah, because they want to say he has no body, no parts, no passions. He floats around space. At the same time, he's nowhere present. That would be one times zero equals zero. That's atheism. So they're really atheists disguising themselves as false religious leaders. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. You know, what, one, two billion now are in these false churches. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you. Well, all they care about is your money, right? You got all these, you know, just, just uh, you know, do some research on the internet. The richest pastors in the world. See how much some of these guys have with their private jets and their huge mansions. They're making merchandise of you. They're asking for your money to give them your money, your money so they can live like a king on earth. Peter prophesied of this 2,000 years ago right here. Bible's true. Prophecy's real. Peter testified these people would arise like that. Whose judgment now long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. They will be damned. 
For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So now he's referring once again to that event in Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God came down from heaven, the angels, the angeloi, uh, theo, of uh, the angels of God. They came down, had sexual relations with the children, with the uh, daughters of mankind, and produced giants in the land. But then God had to destroy them in the flood. Why they destroyed the world? Because you had all these uh, half, uh, you know, and you had all these demigods basically running around doing all kinds of wickedness upon the earth. If he didn't spare them, he already cast them down to hell. You know, this is not the one third who were cast out of the Father's presence. We know that where they are, Peter had just said at the end of chapter one that Satan and his angels, you know, are going around roaring like a lion seeking whom they should devour, right? So that's a separate group of angels. That's not the one-third. The, these guys here are not the one-third. These are the 200 that came down in the book of Enoch and so forth. The Enoch will mention more about it. Okay, so we continue on here. And, they, and God did not, so he didn't spare them. He's not going to spare these false religious leaders. He didn't spare the world. He destroyed them except for Noah and his family. So he's not, you know, he's not going to spare these false uh, religious leaders preaching damnable heresies. And then he goes on about how he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. Okay, now we'll move to 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So once again, a warning to those who have joined the church but then fall back into wickedness. For if they have, if, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. They're going to receive more condemnation than if they had never joined the church. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, not to become a member of the church, than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the book of Proverbs. And he quotes here Proverbs 26, 11, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the so the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Okay, now we get chapter 3. The second epistle, beloved, I now write to you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. <coughs> Excuse me that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What should we be teaching the people when we talk to them about God? Exactly what he just said. What the prophets taught in the Old Testament. What the prophets taught, what the apostles taught in the New Testament. That's all he knew of at that time in terms of scripture. So from what he knew, Old Testament, and they got these beginning of the beginning of the New Testament, got some writings floating around that maybe he perceived would one day be form its own canon or at least be joined together with the Old Testament. Knowing this, first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming, of his second coming? For since the Father has fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Starting to see that today more and more all the time. People come out, ah, look, Jesus isn't coming. Ah, oh, it's just all made up. It's not true. Jesus died, and that was the end of this Jesus of Nazareth that went around being a preacher. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water. So the earth was first created out of the water. Then with his judgments, it was made in the water as he flooded the world, right? Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So the first time he destroyed the world by flood. Second time he's going to destroy the world by fire. That's there are so many scriptures we've looked at over the last two years in the Bible with uh, coming back flying on their uh, flying obstacles, not horses. They're not really going to be Jesus and his angels. Here they come. Look, guys, look at those flying, flying horses in the sky. No, 
they're flying they're coming on there's a, some sort of flying object right they're gonna come they're gonna be shooting down missiles and stuff and destroying all the ungodly okay verse 7 but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same order are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing so be not ignorant so those of you who think that christ isn't coming because it's been two thousand years i want you to not be ignorant of this right is what peter said here that one day is with the lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day so he's saying look I know that in a couple thousand years from now, people are going to start denying his coming, saying, look, Jesus is obviously not coming. It's been 2,000 years. But I want you to know that each of those 1,000 years was only one day to the Lord. So Jesus only been gone 2,000 years. He's only been gone for two days. Hasn't even completed the weekend yet. At least let him have like maybe a, a, a weekend with a holiday on Monday. At least give him a three-day holiday here or something, right, at the three-day uh, Holiday weekend, right? It takes another thousand years. It's only been three days. It takes two thousand years. It's only been four days, right? Give Jesus some time before he comes back to the earth. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But the reason he's been gone for two days is because he's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's given us two days. Uh, before he comes back, at least, to give us a chance to repent of our sins and be prepared for his return. But I tell you, even with all these warnings, in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in our whole conversation and godliness, right? If all these things are going to happen, all this fire and this destruction, should you not be doing your best to live a godly life? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt, shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering Lord of salvation, even as our beloved Paul, here we go, here we go, right? Even as our beloved Paul, also according to the wisdom given in him, hath written unto you. So, do they know about Paul? Yes, right? So we've looked at that before. Even though Paul's saying some very hurtful things about Peter and James and the 12, they are aware of his epistles, right? And here he's trying to reach agreement with Paul and say, look, some of these things, even Paul taught the same things, right? As also in all his epistles, and also in all his epistles, so they've read all the epistles. James knows that Peter, that Paul's telling that he should cut off his private parts and you know, that he's a weak person, and that is a shame against nature for him to have long hair and all these sort of things. You know, they're aware of it, right? <clears throat> and also, all the epistles speaking to them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. He's saying they're going around, they're twisting Paul's words, and they're taking them out of context, and they're making them say things that Paul didn't say. That's what Peter said. And that's been literally fulfilled 2,000 years later. You got all these false uh, religious Christian, uh, so-called Christian leaders going around trying to say, Paul said this, Paul said that. That's not what Paul said. And it's in fulfillment of what Peter said, that in the last days they would be saying false things about Paul and twisting and, and distorting and playing gospel message that Paul taught, namely that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that we need to follow him and keep his commandments, that we don't that we no longer need to keep the law of Moses. That's what he said. Anyone teaches anything other than that or in fulfillment of Peter here, that they're twisting the, the words of Paul. You therefore, brother, a beloved seeing you know these things before be worse, you also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. 
but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And amen. What a great lesson once again, uh, Peter, uh, Peter here in these two books of Peter that he did. And we testify of the truthfulness of these things that we looked at again today, the simpleness of the gospel, the more complexity of the gospel that he taught. We testify that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for our sins. For those not yet members of the church of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come, to come unto the missionaries. Let them help you become a member of his covenant people. Put a uh, link in the description of this video. Just click on and reach out to the missionaries, and they'll help you with what you need to get started. For those of you following in activity in the church, we welcome you with full open arms to come back. Come back to be a member of the community of the saints of God. Closing, we ask God's blessing upon you that you may have safe shelter overhead. You may have food to eat. You may have the basic financial resources you need to carry out your mission upon the earth. We love you. We pray for you every day. And we testify of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. In his name we close this lesson. Amen. <laughs>